Hi, I'm Jason. I'm Fran. This is Bo Peter. And I'm Nicole. And this is Marketing for What Matters, where we explore how marketing paired with a regenerative mindset can uplift humanity, heal the planet, and still achieve profitable business growth. Hey, I'm Jam at Peaceful Media. Welcome to Marketing for What Matters podcast, episode number two. I'm delighted to introduce you to two lovely people from the state of Hawaii, Tristan and Corey. They are the co-founders of Wakeful State, a video production company that is uh, primarily focused on helping sustainable brands and nonprofits, organizations out there in the islands tell their story more effectively through the visual mediums. And our worlds overlapped in that we were working with Soil Food Web School. They were working with ecosystem restoration camps back in the day when John D. Lou was just launching some of the, the prototypes, prototype uh, camps there uh, and helped them raise funds and get the word out about the brand. They did it so effectively. I just had to have them on our show. And uh, thankfully, they were willing to jump on and, and be my guinea pigs here in the first recording I've ever done for the podcast. Now, frankly, I made a major mistake in that I butchered the name of a nonprofit that they're deeply involved with called Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii, not Shorelines, Coastlines Hawaii. So uh, thankfully, they corrected me halfway through, but I had already made the mistake about eight times. So um, yeah, learning, uh, learning transparently through uh, through this medium. So uh, what you're going to ex experience here is uh, I'm going to share a demo reel that they put together for the show here, so you can get a sense for you know, sort of putting, sort of how they how they shape the video material that they're shooting, and how they tell stories visually. Um, and then at the end, uh, you're going to see sort of a bolt on a video that I asked them to shoot um, after we had recorded, and that is with uh, our partnership with One Tree Planted. Uh, after we had recorded, we started our partnership there, and that looks like this. Every episode, we're gonna, our guest is going to have a chance to plant some trees with us. We're going to plant trees on their behalf, and they get to choose which region or what type of impact they want to have through that partnership with us. And um, so you're going to see Tristan and Corey jump back on with something they just shot on their, their phones there to explain where they'd like to plant those trees and why. So if you are interested in using video more effectively to tell your brand story and move people to become uh, uh, more emotionally attached to your brand, uh, do check out this episode. And without further ado, let's jump on in. Hey, Tristan and Corey, we're live here in the Marketing for What Matters podcast. I'd love for us to start with just a brief introduction uh, to you guys and what your roles are and what Wakeful State is all about. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us. We're super stoked to be on the podcast. I'm Corey. I'm Tristan. Yeah, thank you, Jam. Gratitude for having us on. We appreciate it. Yeah, so Wakeful State is our video production business that we founded in 2017. 
We're located in Honolulu, Hawaii, and we work with forward thinking businesses and nonprofits um, to help solve problems through video storytelling. Beautiful. Well, why did you guys start this business? Oh, uh, you, you go first, Claire. Okay. So it's kind of like a long story, but I guess the origin story would be after graduating, I traveled for a few years as a digital nomad. I was a graphic and web designer, ended up traveling across the globe pretty much, met Tristan in Hawaii, and we really connected over our love of storytelling, um, ended up becoming a couple. And within just a few months, because I was Canadian, I had to leave the country, um, could not stay in the US. And so I convinced Tristan to sell all of his things, sell his car, everything, quit his job that he had, and we began traveling nomadically around the world. And in, the, in that time traveling, we were, we were in um, Europe, North Africa, Asia, and we began filmmaking. So we would meet business owners, people that just needed help making video content, and that's kind of where we got started. We shot a video for a boutique Riyadh, kind of like a boutique hotel in Morocco. We ended up shooting a dog treats commercial in Ireland. Uh, we were shooting in Japan. Um, we shot for ecosystem restoration camps in Spain, which is I know how you found out about us. Yeah. Um, Tris, you want to jump in? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think when I met Corey, I was working in hotel management and I didn't love that. I was pretty tired of that. On the <laughs> Weird. Yeah. Uh, it was a nice, yeah, it was a good, it was like a, nice to be young and, and have a job in Hawaii. But after a while, I was totally over it. And I met Corey and she was traveling and she was a programmer and that was pretty inspiring. Um, yeah. Just somebody kind of going down their own path. Um, and I had been working also in sustainability uh, and in sort of a, an environmental activist on the side outside of my day job with an organization called Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii. And that was uh, pretty early on in like the ocean plastic issue, sort of reaching the public consciousness. Um, friends and I founded this beach cleanup organization. And for a long time, that was really fulfilling. But I think when I met Corey, I was ready for something, something else outside of that sort of uh, specific issue. And I wanted to sort of expand um, my storytelling skills and try to sort of raise consciousness around uh, other issues and sort of apply that storytelling skill set. And we ended up picking that up um, on the road and then returning to Hawaii to found our company um, and plugging into that network of Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii, um, friends of the organization who had businesses and other nonprofits. Those were our first clients that's really how we built out our portfolio um, on the job and just yeah. being self-taught, learning from, learning from the web and YouTube un University and just cor production <laughs> courses that we found online. Yeah, yeah as, as many uh, small business owners do, is go out and hustle and find what is that next skill you need. Um, yeah, I, I would love to have the sustainable shorelines on as a, as an additional episode. I think the work you guys are doing there is, is brilliant and impressive and like overwhelmingly positive and needed as right. a side note, my daughters absolutely love your logo. I don't know if Corey, if you designed that with the triple, the dolphins in the shape of the recycling it triangle. Wasn't, yeah. Actually, so Tristan was one of the co-founders of Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii. I actually ended up meeting him a couple of years after the organization was founded. And that was, I think, something that initially attracted me to him and that we connected over was just our passion for environmentalism, for wanting to make a difference. And, and like Tristan said, after the two years of travel, we came back and we decided, you know, we're going to make a commitment to filmmaking and continue with this endeavor and just help local organizations um, where we can. Yeah. And I know with a, a company this small, you know, it's, you're not this sprawling corporate behemoth. It still has a lot of soul in it. Um, and usually in my, in, in a peaceful media's case, it's a, it's an expression of the owner's soul that you, you know, the type of projects you're doing. I just, uh, in the sustainability realm, um, there's so many facets. I think the UN has like 17, 18 different facets of sustainability initiatives. I'm kind of curious to hear from you guys, what are the initiatives that are most uh, important to you guys to demonstrate if you're like kind of thinking of dream projects and dream clients, what would you be 
uh, sort of listing out in terms of in the sustainability space. Do you have a no, dream I, client that's I, coming I have to I have to think about that for a second. Why don't you mm-hmm. go ahead? Um, yeah, for me, I like the broadness of the projects. I mean, people, they niche down. I don't really want to niche down <laughs> necessarily as a creative. Um, I think we have sort of um, just through our work, we've created a brand just by the people that are attracted to us. Um, I think it's sort of organically happened. Um, you can kind of see the energy of the projects that we've done. Yeah, personally, I think I have ADD, so a variety <laughs> of projects. I'm, I'm diagnosed, but self-diagnosed through research. But I think, yeah, I think I found a good, uh, after much trial and error, deep into uh, deep into my life, I think I found a good career that's a good fit in terms of like um, having bringing a sort of a Zen beginner's mind to every project and then diving deep into something new. I think in the hotel world or past jobs in my life, I've done a lot of different things. Like I would be bored with like sort of the repetitive nature of something. I did real estate appraisals, hotel management. And by the end of hotel management, I I could predict what some like a guest was going to say coming up to me. It was kind of bizarre. Like it was uh, just repetitive. I mean, it's tourists coming in and um, yeah. (laughs) I mean, I, I could predict like somebody coming up and being like, oh, you lost your wallet at Waimea Bay and you need me to call the police for you and be like, how did you know that? <laughs> just I've just seen, so you'd see it sort of the repetitive nature of the requests and things coming in. So I think um, just being able to apply sort of that, uh, taking that beginner's mind as a strength going into each project and diving deep with the client. Yeah, and in terms of the clients we do want to work with, I mean, it's anyone who's really prioritizing a triple bottom line, anyone who any organization or a brand that is really prioritizing, I don't want to say quality, but they're they're interested in sustainability, they're interested in making the world better, making it a more peaceful place, making it a better place in general, rather than just going after profits. So that's the type of business that we want to work with. Amen. That's, that's probably why the consumers who are watching it. I think the main thing to begin with is just who is your audience and what is your goal? To get really clear and really specific on what you actually need to achieve, and especially with video storytelling and video marketing, you're moving You could either be moving people through a sales funnel, um, you know, to purchasing your product or your service, or you're um, just telling a story in general that's maybe raising awareness or something like that. When we work with a client, we really try to understand what the organization has done and where they want to go so we can create something that really is honed in in, and, and will help them achieve really specific outcomes. Um, Another key part is really just an understanding of storytelling and an understanding of human psychology. Um, The reason why storytelling is so effective is is because it has the amazing power and ability to emotionally move and connect with an audience. Um, So I think a key part of that is understanding like what's actually driving your audience, what's going to pull at their heartstrings, what's going to create empathy, what's going to create an actual relationship with them rather than just like a hard sell of like a product. One example that comes to mind is um, we've been working with Hawaii Island Humane Society for the past couple of years doing fundraising videos for them. So in the case of their audience, their donors really respond to animal stories, specifically learning about their personalities, you know, their history. Maybe they got run over by a car, maybe, you know, they were abandoned, whatever it is. So when we put together these fundraising films, we have that in the top of our mind. And um, with the help of their team, you know, we're, we're capturing stories of these individual animals and what they've gone through. So then when they show our video at their fundraising gala in the past two years, um, I think each time right after, you know, they show our film, they get everyone to raise their paddles and they raised probably, I think, what was it? Like, Five hundred thousand dollars each time, just because you're 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 pulling at people's heart heartstrings, you're emotionally priming them to want to give because they're connecting with something that feels bigger than themselves that they want to be a part of. Yeah, often the animal story is one of like um, healing or like a, a transition from coming in like ragged to being uh, looking like a beautiful sort of thriving animal or cat. 
that is in a loving home. So it's a it's a bit of a tear jerking sort of uh, story on the animal spotlights. So that's helpful. But I have another yeah. uh, thing that I think is important for businesses and and people that want to get into video marketing and storytelling. I think quality is just really important. You really need to invest in quality visuals. The sound needs to sound good, needs to sound realistic. Like high production value is something that I think sometimes newer companies, younger companies kind of overlook because like it's a process to get there. You don't go from doing these huge high value productions overnight. Um, but given whatever your resources is, whatever your resources are or what team you have available, you want to create the highest production value possible. Because when you look at something and it's not done well, um, your brand loses credibility and it loses authority. So you want your audiences to trust you. You want them to have a relationship with your brand or with you. And the way to do that is to create something that's just very high. Yeah. Which segues perfectly into that the question I have about for businesses who are starting out have less resources but are doing good in the world and and want to use video um, what would you say to them to you know do what they can with what they have to make an impact that's funny because uh, that's something I wrote in my notes when when you uh, sent over your questions it's like do what you can with what you have um, literally just yeah. that. Uh, yeah, I don't know who that quote is attributable to, but I think it's a number of people if you Google it. But um, yeah, I would say like start where you are and you can progress from there. You have to get like a foothold and it's almost better to walk in sort of naively um, with the uh, sort of gusto of like uh, someone who wants to uh, do whatever the goal is that you have whatever you want to share with the world, whether it's your business, um, whatever you have, like whatever the elixir is that you have from your experience that you want to share with others, just get a foothold. And there's so many resources out there. As I was saying earlier, like you can learn how to incrementally um, increase your production value um, as you go. And I think it's about, for me, I think it's about keeping it fun um, I'd like to do more fun projects. Having fun. That's fun, very key. More fun, like yeah. branded content. I think that was something that was really mm -hmm. um, helpful in the early days of the Beach Cleanup nonprofit um, that I been. We tried to stay close to um, like beach culture and surf culture and make the events really inclusive and fun um, for the whole family. So I think if you can keep your content fun, and educational if you can entertain people i think that's really really powerful and if you can do that with short short content in the beginning and get creative um if you have a small team you can do it with your with your iphone like the newest iphone is unreal uh the quality of that is is wild nowadays and that that takes a lot of the um sort of the technical aspect out of it and creates a beautiful picture another suggestion would be to spend a day really planning or even multiple days really planning out the content so that when you go to film you can actually batch the content so because filming can be such a stressful overwhelming process maybe you require props maybe you know you have lighting whatever camera you're nervous on camera um it's really really helpful to plan it out ahead of time and so then when you have the camera set up you can film multiple videos and then later on when you want to post to social media for example it can be split into small pieces that can be posted on a more regular basis so then you're getting that regular engagement with your audience i think if you're starting out another great thing would just be to get in front of the camera and get comfortable that's a skill that you have to learn it doesn't just happen overnight right so especially if your brand is one where you're forward facing you really need to get on camera, practice. And, and I think nowadays people just connect with people. So when they see your face, when they're interacting with your brand a lot and they're um, feeling connected to you, it's going to build that trust, which builds the relationship. Yeah. yeah like uh, seven hours plus of time, like with somebody, whether on online or offline is building that trust to potentially make a purchase. So I think what Corey said is really powerful, like the reels, batching the reels. You could have your new iPhone set up, have a, a colleague or maybe find a freelancer in your area with a minimal light setup um, and 
if you are running your own business or organization, you're an expert in whatever it is that you do. You might not value your expertise as much, but there are people out there who have, who don't have your level of knowledge in your area and to educate them and, and inform is a powerful thing. And the internet will sort of help you find that audience and they'll be appreciative of that information. I do have one idea, but if you want to go ahead. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. My last, my last suggestion for new business owners is to consider the idea of a video sales trifecta. So in video marketing, you're moving a customer through a sales funnel, capturing their attention and interest, providing valuable information about a product or service, building trust, and then ultimately persuading them to take a desired action, like making a purchase, becoming a loyal customer. So the idea of the sales trifecta is it's a strategy that starts with a promotional video on social media that will hook and attract viewers and send them to your website. And then when they get to your website, you'll have a brand video um, or a brand storytelling video on sort of front and center on your homepage that builds more trust, establishes more credibility, explains what your offerings might be. And then as they scroll down the page, you can have testimonial videos that would finish off that sales trifecta where you're, you know, creating social proof, you're um, just in showing, showing potential customers how your product or service like changed their life. And then that's kind of like the thing that can seal the deal and helping the customer decide to make the purchase. I love the, the, the crowdfunding piece I saw, uh, for ecosystem restoration camps uh, stood out. It had that, that imbued in, in, within the material and the way you guys produce it, are there any other pivotal, you know, projects that you've done where it really clicked that this is like service you're providing through your business as a, as a mission alignment for you, for you personally? Yes. There have been actually a role that come to mind. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go first? Um, I could go. Yeah. I think okay. expanding on like, uh, just the thought of like what the businesses that we want to work with or, or nonprofits that we want to work with. I think it's just things that resonate as solution based and that are going to move, uh, move the needle and move humanity in a positive direction. I, I don't think of sustainability as like the separate thing in business anymore. I think of it more as just like, it's part of the way we need to move forward. If we want to keep moving forward, I think it's just like, uh, should be integrated in just the way we approach Mm -hmm. any type of business if we want to continue to do business on the planet. Um, but some of the things that have really s s stuck out to me, I think it was, it's really in the beginning, it was helping friends, organizations and adding value. I think for us, it's always about just delivering the most high quality product we can with the small team that we have and the resources available. We're always looking for ways to up level the production um, there what? was a fun full circle moment, um, more recently when, um, sustainable coastlines Hawaii got its first, the nonprofit that some friends and I started in 2011, um, it got its seed money from, uh, the Johnson Ohana foundation, which is, uh, Jack Johnson and Kim Johnson's, uh, he's a famous musician. It was their sort of, uh, uh, philanthropy. Um, organization. They gave us $10,000 to really get going after we, a uh, small group of friends and I each put in like $60 to start our first cleanup. And that was our little investment seed money. But they saw what we were doing, took a chance on us, uh, fast forward, like uh, last year. Um, so like 2023, fast forward from 20, the Kakua Hawaii Foundation, which is Kim and Jack Johnson's nonprofit. That's been a long or been around longer than Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii by a number of years, um, they're having their 20th anniversary. And they asked us to do a 20 minute short documentary on them. So it was kind of this full circle moment for me personally. Yeah. Um, it was kind of trippy to be sitting behind the camera filming with um, their, organ their amazing organization, which is mostly a, um, a female team and to be interviewing Kim and Jack Johnson um, because I never imagined being a filmmaker. I was like a 17 year old kid who, um, I can remember watching his surf films. He was a cinematographer. I can remember watching yeah, before he was a musician, his surf films, um, as a kid in New York, just a surf stoked 
kid um, just eating up these like 16 <laughs> millimeter beautiful films that he was filming with his amazing uh, crew of friends that were uh, all professionals at the time. But yeah, it was just a, a cool full circle moment to um, have yeah. put in that work and then um, be able to deliver them a, a good product in the uh, final final film. And just because the work of Kokua Hawaii Foundation is so amazing, like their environmental nonprofit focuses on teaching kids composting, local food systems, farming, you know, like all eating this healthy. eating healthy, all the stuff that we're really interested in. So it was cool because it was a 20 year anniversary video. We got to interview around like 50 people that had been a part of the organization over the past 20 years. So we could like see kids that had gone through the program that are now like professors at University of Hawaii teaching sustainability. So just seeing um, the impact of the organization, that was an amazing experience. And then the other project that I think was really pivotal was, I think it was two or three years ago now, we worked with United Airlines and Conservation International in Kanu, Hawaii to create a video for something called Pledge to Our Keiki which is a pledge that was like a stewardship pledge that was written by Hawaiian school children um, about taking care of the island, about, you know, if it's... Um, mindful tourism. Mi exactly, mindful tourism. So it's a video that actually plays on the United Airlines flights now coming into Hawaii, reminding visitors and returning residents like to take care of the islands. But what was really cool about that project is we got to work with so many kids and we got to go across the Hawaiian islands, fly in an open door helicopter, you know, all that good stuff, just collecting footage um, of kids in nature. So that was a really, really fun project. Yeah. I, I love these stories of when entrepreneur, entrepreneurs are doing good in the world and suddenly like new doors that they would never have access to are suddenly opened up to be able to work with Jack Johnson, for instance. Yeah. I was going to ask you like if Warren Buffett gave you a, a huge budget to explore an initiative that you think would, uh, would help shape the world. But I think you may have already like started this project or completed the project for the Jack, <laughs> for the Johnson foundation there. So I would love to like share, like imagine a small business owner who's um, listening to this podcast or a big business doesn't really matter, but it's, uh, I'd love to share some practical advice and insights about how you uh, tell these stories, um, how you start approaching a project like the 20 minute documentary for that foundation. Um, and what's the kind of a framework that, that business owners can use to tell their story and move uh, you infuse so much sales and, and, you know, sort of marketing psychology into the filmmaking work that you do. It's clear that you have a, uh, not necessarily a marketing background, but you understand digital marketing, uh, in modern times. And I want to go back to that, the sustainable shorelines example, because I think, um, I think consumers are the linchpin here. Like they're the keystone. If we can, compel consumers to think just a little bit more about that, that plastic bottle that they're tossing or even purchasing. If we can compel them and persuade them that it is in their best interest to shift out of some of the, the conventional packaging and ways of doing, uh, ways of living, right. Mm -hmm. Then we can really move the needle across the globe. It's going to take a lot of consumers demanding businesses, uh, to behave and package differently. Right. And so in that context of sustainable shorelines, uh, what have you found moves the needle, moves consumers to uh, think, be, do things differently mm -hmm. um, as it pertains to their purchasing decisions and also their behaviors um, on the islands? Wait, so I just want to first correct you. So it's actually... Mm -hmm coastlines Hawaii, not sustainable shorelines, but it's all good. All good. Tristan, your answer. Yeah, that's a good, good question. I think it's a connecting, connecting that to like something that people, connecting that decision to something that people care about or feel that they're a part of. A part of. Yeah, whether it's the surf culture, beach culture, or the ocean in general, it's uh, for me, it's like, showing what your your decisions are impacting and then if there is a better choice to be made making it easy for the consumer to make that choice and helping helping them sort of see that they can have an impact and maybe that can be that making a better choice can become part of their identity in a way 
that they are the type of person that will do that for me like early on that that um that sort of project was really in the early days before that knowledge of like ocean plastic was really in the zeitgeist or like the public consciousness friends two friends kahi and louise picaro they traveled to um new zealand and they met um people focused on the issue down there it's actually called sustainable coastlines those guys gave us permission to basically start uh hawaii chapter wasn't super connected to um the new zealand branch but um there was collaboration and sort of it became its own thing but yeah i think nowadays like early on it was about like getting people out and showing them the impact the new zealand crew came for a um conference and they were we were surfers like our our group of friends were surfers and i think we were looking for a way to like do an experiment and like do something positive um together and those guys came to a conference these two two friends and they they pointed at the ground to the ground to us and like hawaii was um one of the ground zeros for ocean plastic it was on the beaches that we were frequenting but we didn't see it until they pointed it to us so part of that is like it's a uh, showing showing the public showing your audience what it is that they should be aware of or they might want to be aware of or what it is that they're not seeing i think nowadays to me it's like it's not as much as on that issue it's not as much a, an issue of awareness and education it's i think we need innovation in materials um material yeah. science to really make an impact in that space that's kind of where my head is at these days um yeah. i think we need to replace replace uh these products with uh, a new new material to give the consumer a better option um plastic is pretty effective for a lot of things it's just we we need new innovation to uh deal with that problem i think yeah i mean, i um Sorry, by the way, for <laughs> butchering the name. It's all good. Uh, I, I, my mind seems to like the alliteration. <laughs> um, shoreline, the, uh, sustainable coastlines. I'm, I'm actually, I'd love to dive just a little bit deeper into the psychology piece of this. Uh, so I think this is like the, the key for uh, other storytellers and and business owners is how do we how do we compel a consumer to understand that by paying an extra dollar for the organic version, um, they're doing something wildly positive for nature, for instance, or, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, like what, what is, what is the, the framework for persuading people to assign higher value and, and look at that purchase? Yes, it's an extra dollar, but it's in their best interest to pay that extra dollar so that the farmer can not kill all of the pollinators, um, within their farm yeah for example i think it's just about it, the change really has to happen in the consumer where they're recognizing that we are part of the environment we are not separate the actions that these like when we litter when we you know continue to produce plastic products that never really go away or pesticides or, or pesticides or any of these things like we're hurting ourselves so that's where i feel like there is sort of a lack of education or it's maybe it's not a lack of education there's just a disconnection between people and the places that like especially in the natural spaces in cities in like you see you see it even here in a place where you can be so connected in you know to nature where there's mountains ocean natural beauty all around us and you still see people who are disconnected so i don't really know what the solution is i just know for me becoming more aware of how my actions affect the environment have led to us making better purchasing decisions and it's as simple as that i think you right. Corey was alluding to like the interconnectedness of everything and painting that picture for your audience um, from the perspective of whatever it is that you do and what what p part of that you want to communicate for your brand or organization and then yeah just showing the impacts and 
showing a, a hopeful yeah. worldview um, that they can be a part be of, a part of yeah. uh, in community yeah. and maybe become more connected to your community and the world um, that you envision your brand sort of having an impact on. I made a connection with a, the CEO of a World Wildlife Fund for a particular country. Um, and so she was witness to a large scale consumer behavior campaigns, like trying to uh, help people shift out of the old school um, light bulbs and just do the LED. And mm -hmm. um, what they found was that by uh, the environment and so forth, um, just completely bombed. Like as that story um, did nothing to move the needle. Whereas if they came through it with a frame of, hey, do you want to know how you can save, you know, five in electricity across the year for your family? That like, whew, you know, that moved the LED bulbs. You oh, know? Yeah. Uh, that, that moved it. And so I'm, um, I'm curious about how you technically look at that, that framing uh, when you're thinking about the sort of sustainability storytelling uh, projects mm -hmm. that you take on. Uh, when you were just sharing that last point, it made me think of, um, yeah, I think it's, a, it's about, for me, it's about positivity and like, where can we move to that is maybe better than where we're at? Um, I don't like sort of the doom and gloom. I don't think that moves people to action. I think it's like, we want to inspire folks to uh, move forward into a, a future that is hopeful. There's a lot, I mean, in, even in the stories that we tell, there's a lot of like, uh, like Armageddon sort of storytelling. There has been a lot of that, um, for most of my life, it's like the movies and books and films. Um, but there is a new sort of genre that is trying to take hold that made me think when you were mentioning the, um, sort of energy saving, um, solar punk, it's sort of like a cyberpunk um okay. genre but solar punk <laughs> yeah that's, that's Tech, a clever brand yeah technology is integrated i mean there'll be green walls growing food on in cities and um solar powered um drones like helping with farming but it's like a it's a marriage of like technology and nature um for like a hopeful world view so i think inspiring we try to tell inspiring stories we don't want to focus on the yeah. doom and gloom aspects to like bum people out. I think if you're bumming people out, you're not going to get them up and it's, drive driven to take the action. It's not just, it's not just bumming them out though. It's literally inciting fear in them because when you watch those types of things, like you feel afraid and you don't want to make things better. You feel hopeless. So like Tristan said, yeah, we're all about creating content that is inspiring. That does show positive solutions um, and really amplifying organizations and people who are doing those, doing that type of work. And one one other point I was going to say, I, get, I think people in sustainability, we can get like perfectionistic and like um, sort of uh, maybe get a little bit frozen in, in inaction, like thinking about our impacts. But I think it's about progress um, and um, new ideas, like the like the bar um of what like today's today's problems were solutions and uh innovative solutions decades ago and like that bar is just gonna always be uh ahead of us um and we're always gonna have to like the solution that we come out to with today for x problem is gonna work for a while and then we're gonna see unintended consequences and we're gonna have to pivot for that down the line and just knowing that like you have if you're gonna make an omelet you have to break a few eggs and you have to learn <laughs> and you have to like get started and like move forward. So as uh, consumers of media yourselves and people who deeply understand storytelling to, um, to persuade, you know, most documentary films, most promo videos are trying to persuade mm -hmm. the viewer to believe, do or have something uh, different than where, where they started. Right. So. Uh, are there particular pieces of media that you've seen recently that have really opened up your awareness and inspired you guys to act differently? You have one? 
Um, I mean, there's so many. Yes. I mean, you're not just talking within sustainability, right? You're just saying in general or. Yeah. In the, in the realm of sustainability, ideally. Okay. Um, well, yeah, uh, there's, there's something that a sustainable brand can look to as an effective piece of media that's outside of that space. That's totally uh, relevant to. Um, recently, let's see, Trist, anything? Um, I've been like, uh, for me, sustainability is also about, it's just about improved personal development and like, um, learning. It's like, for me, I'm constantly learning. I'm, I'm on the web, just seeking out weird sort of rabbit holes that, uh, suit my interest. Um, I'm interested recently in like Jungian psychology and trying to understand people and stories and characters in a deeper way. Um, I did watch an old film and I kind of went down a rabbit hole of this one director's films. Uh, this guy, Godfrey Reggio, he was like a monk when he was younger. And then he got into filmmaking later on. Um, he put out this series of three films. He, he's in his seventies probably, but he comes out with films like not, not that often, like once a, or twice a decade. Um, Koyanis Katsi, I think it's a Hopi Native American word. It's like basically world out of balance and it's, uh, there, there's no dialogue, but it's, um, sort of nature shots and they were, he was pretty, the, the filmmaking is pretty innovative at the time, but that visual language is in a lot of what we see now with, um, time lapses of machinery and like cities alive at night with lights and uh he got permission to use this hopi word koyanis katsi um basically there's like something wrong with the um industrial world that we're living in now it's like a world out of balance out of touch um but he's got a number of films that are pretty interesting and i'm i'm always looking for um sort of new creative filmmaking uh inspirations to uh take into our work personally and mm -hmm. that's that's a little rabbit hole that people could go down if they want to look back at that and also to just continue what tristan was saying about personal development some books that have really also helped us would be how to do the work by dr nicole lapera as well as origins of you um those two books focus on healing childhood trauma and it's just really helped us as people and i think when you heal your soul, when you heal yourself more, you're able, you have more capacity, you have more um, willingness, openness, uh, drive, ambition, um, just, yeah, ability to, to, to get the work done. So that's been really helpful to us. And then another, um, if somebody's looking for a really inspirational um, documentary, um, John D. Liu, who is one of the original founders of uh, ecosystem restoration camps now called ecosystem restoration communities, I believe. But he has a documentary called Green Gold. Have you seen that one? I haven't seen okay. it. That one's it's really, so that, up my alley. It's really <laughs> good. It's all about, um, so basically John D. Liu, he was a cameraman at first and he ended up becoming a soil scientist later. But the re like his whole, the inspiration for his journey in, in going deeper into environmentalism was he was put on a project filming the Los Plateau in China, which had been severely degraded by years of over farming, over grazing. And so they let the land rest. They actually paid farmers to uh, stay off the land. And in this documentary, you just witness this total transformation of a completely, you know, beat up, um, infertile land transforming like all of these waterfalls returning the land regreening um, in like seven years in in a very very short period of time yes yeah, just a couple of years and so it was just really really inspiring so I really recommend that to anyone um, and then and that actually led to me actually reaching out to John D. Liu and we ended up working with him and at, like, cause he be, ended up becoming a, becoming a filmmaker. So that's how we got linked with him and ended up going to Spain and filming with him. But that was just a cool one because yeah, we, I watched the documentary, reach out to him, end up working with him. Um, so yeah, I really recommend that one. Do you find that, uh, a lot of people who are ambassadors for sustainability and, and restoring the earth are receptive to this, this type of outreach? 
I think it's, it can be a really effective way to Unbelievably, like get yeah. your foot in the door if you can be competent and offer competent enough in an area that you can then offer um, your skills as a volunteer to get yourself in the room with folks that you want to be in the room with. I think right. that's a really good way to, um, if you're early in your career, that's a really good way to sort of kick it off or get to different levels yeah. of the game. I actually have another story like that where I reached out to an environmental um, activist, sur pro surfer, uh, Emmy Award win winning filmmaker, Cyrus Sutton. He was working on a film called Island Earth. This was like several years ago now. I was living in Thailand at the time as a digital nomad. I saw that he was making this documentary about GMO seed testing in Hawaii. And I had just traveled around the Hawaiian islands on my own and I was just really drawn to them. So I sent him a message on Instagram. You know, he had, I don't know how many, maybe like a hundred thousand followers at the time, 50,000, who knows? It was, it was a lot. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a long shot, but I, I didn't have any experience in filmmaking at that time, you know, and I'm approaching this Emmy award-winning director, wrote him a message, told him, you know, I'm interested in helping. And he actually responded. I think he was a little taken aback at first. He's like, is this, is this woman crazy? But anyway, um, connected with him and he ended up inviting me to come out pretty much the next day to fly out to Hawaii to assist on the production. And we ended up traveling around the Hawaiian islands um, and meeting all these different people and filming with them. And that was just an amazing experience because it really taught me sort of a behind the scenes look at filmmaking. I had never been exposed to it before. And in a way that was like the seed for our entire business because I had just made that one reach out to Cyrus, not knowing if he was going to respond and he did. So my advice for anyone uh, who, who wants to, you know, reach their goals or who has a vision for what they want, it's like you have to connect with like-minded people who are already doing it or try to find people who, who you could collaborate with to make that dream a reality. And it sounds like you took that one step further and, and actually volunteered, like with ERC, for instance. Sounds like you guys took that on as a, as a pro bono, a give to that community and that mission. Um, so for all you aspiring filmmakers who are out there trying to do more good in the world, uh, take that note because there's a, there's a lot of those opportunities of, you know, I'm here to serve, servant's heart. Let's go make an impact here and just having that peace. Heck, it's, uh, it's I know marketing for what matters isn't a massive podcast, no Joe Rogan or anything like that, but heck, that's what brought us together, right? You're getting there. Yeah, it was You're there. on your path. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> on the way. Um, no, I, I really appreciate the, the, the last few segments that have really helped aspiring filmmakers. It's going to be, um, really insightful for, I know there's so many creatives out there who want to do something with their talents to make a difference in the world. So just hearing how you guys got that started, uh, was, was really insightful and motivating. Thanks, Jim. Thank uh, yeah. So I, I think we're going to wrap up here, but I would love to hear what, uh, what's exciting and new for wakeful state and, and things that you'd like, um, our audience to watch out for mm -hmm. as, uh, as you're looking at 2024 and beyond. Um, let's see. Um, we've been working with, um, Shangri-La museum a lot lately. It's a museum, uh, in Honolulu. Um, it's actually an old estate. It was a Doris Duke estate. She was a, um, a, an heiress in the early 1900s who built a home on the ocean and uh, it's all Islamic art but now they're sort of um, bringing in artists and thought leaders on different social um, sort of social justice and topics to speak and sort of using it as a world hub for conversations and we're doing a lot of um, event filming there and producing um, short content for social media uh, about these conversations. One was on uh, civil rights and like child welfare recently. Another one on like AI and ethics um, recently as well. Yeah, so if you're in Hawaii, actually come check out Shangri-La Museum of Islamic Art, Culture and Design because we're at a lot of their events filming, doing photography. Um, we're also working with uh, the Domestic Violence Action Center right now on a short documentary with them. So that's uh, been an amazing project so far. Um, what else are we doing? I want to plug um, plug my friend's course that he's working on called Abundance Accelerator. Uh, we went through like version 1.0. Uh, he's a, a 
friend and like a uh, coach, life coach, business coach, and created this course that we went through that was uh, super helpful for us personally and professionally, um, sort of looking at your life and beliefs that you hold um, internally and seeing where there's uh, room for growth or where certain ideas you might hold might be conflicting. Self-limiting beliefs, Self -limiting essentially. Self-limiting beliefs. Yeah. Identifying um, those. He's a, a friend, Samir Vias, and uh, we hope to be filming that uh, course maybe this summer, and hopefully it can be online and more people can have access to it um, if he's able to come through Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah, that was really helpful for us. So helpful. Um, we're also working with, uh, we're kind of finishing up a project right now with uh, Obama's sister, Maya Satori. Mm -hmm. She has a nonprofit called Institute of Climate and Peace where they have. Uh, programs that support the mentoring of young women around climate related issues in Hawaii. So if you're a young woman and you're into climate stuff, um, check out Institute of Climate and Peace. Uh, we're also doing like a series of series on e-bikes funded by Department of Transportation right now. So we, a whole a whole bunch of projects, but probably we could just talk about the best place to follow along and find us so we don't go on forever here. Um, but we're at Wakeful State on Instagram, wakefulstate.com. Uh, is our website. Um, I also have a separate portrait photography, event photography side hustle called Sun Sessions HI um, on Instagram and Sun Sessions HI. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, we'll include uh, we'll include links to some of your pieces and your website and, and socials here on uh, the show notes. And uh, until uh, next time, we will uh, sign off and say, you know, let's let's do everything we can with our professional energy to make a difference in the world and um, and make this world a brighter place. Thank you so much, Tristan and Corey, for joining me. Wakeful State uh, is an amazing filmmaking company doing great work in the world. So I hope you go check them out. And uh, until we see you next time. Peace. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Hi there, Corey and Tristan here with Wakeful State. Uh, just want to thank Jam and the team at Peaceful Media for having us on the podcast. We're stoked to hear about the partnership with One Tree Planted, and we're going to choose biodiversity as our tree planting solution. Um, reading a book by Merlin Sheldrake on fungi and the interconnectedness of life in um, forests and jungles. And yeah, just into biodiversity at the moment. So thanks for doing that. Looking forward to uh, perhaps seeing the trees planted. Thank you for tuning in to our podcast, Marketing for What Matters. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, Google, or Pandora. Love the show? Leave us a review and follow us on social media at Peaceful Media to stay up to date about new episodes. And as always, thank you to this earth for giving us all we've ever needed. See you next time.